Chris, I never forgot your last name. Chris Taylor, a Mashable, is joining us as the moderator of this discussion. Uh, between Randy Barker, who was formerly of Facebook and is now off on her own to help start us, um, and Rick Marini, the CEO of Brancha, which has been getting some really great press lately. I know my empire is growing very good. Right? <laughs> so I'll let you guys do more formal introduction of each other. Uh, thank you all. Have fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're going to get some bar stools so that you guys in the back can see and hear us a little bit better. But, oh, good. Okay. We were, we were debating yeah. that. Yeah. We can go That's train. probably sure. the best way to do it. We will move here. And we also Thank don't you. have any microphones or anything, so... Too loud. So if you guys can't hear me, you know, because I tend to speak in a kind of a quiet British tone of voice, <laughs> uh, just chat <laughs> something like, speak up your breath. Um, or those of us in front can just tweet yeah. you at yeah. Future Boy, and the rest right. will follow. Thank you. <laughs> at Future Boy. Although it would be not checking out. That's what Jerry Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We thought it was so pretty, but yeah, apparently you guys can't see. So no expense fed. Okay. 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 So, okay. 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 So I think if you guys could just talk a little bit about yourselves, introduce yourselves, say where you worked. Uh, Randy obviously has a famous ex-employer. Oh, yeah. yes. And then, uh, Rick can talk about I do have a famous ex-employer, and I offer and try and recall if I had a life before that employer. But it did um, take me 15 years to get there um, doing PR from the moment I graduated from college, um, all in tech and, and a little bit of consumer internet prior to Facebook, but um, the four and a half years that I was there are probably most relevant um, in terms of failures for everybody here, because believe it or not, even though I took the company from 7 million users and the first cover I got, Mark Zuckerberg, was Fast Company back in 2007 in March. And the last thing I did was got him on the cover of Time as person of the year. There were tons of failures in between, um, and I'm happy to talk about any of them to help all of you avoid that in the process. Um, in December, I left Facebook, and I am now consulting with startups and high growth companies. I say high growth because Groupon is my client right now, um, and they don't qualify as startup any longer, but um, they certainly have a very small PR team, um, and now a new vice president of corporate communications there. Um, so they have also had interesting challenges, and I'm sure you're all reading about a lot of them right now. Um, and Cora is my other client, my, a very small startup, 20-person company um, Q&A website. So that's where I am now. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rick Moraney. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Branch Out. I've been an entrepreneur here in Silicon Valley for about 12 years. Uh, first company I did was called Tickle.com. Tickle was the largest uh, personality testing site, one of the largest social media sites on the internet. We were uh, number 18 at one point, and uh, we were very fortunate to sell that to Monster for about 100 million back in 04. Did a second company uh, called Superfan, which did social games and Facebook apps, and then we pivoted that company about a year ago, and now uh, doing Branch Out. So hopefully, uh, some or all of you are using Branch Out. It's the largest professional networking service on Facebook and that allows you to leverage your existing friend network on Facebook to be able to get great opportunities for jobs and recruiting or sales and so on. We've uh, been fortunate to get a lot of good press in the last uh, year or so. We uh, raised our Series A in September, six million from Excel and a couple other VCs. And then we just raised a Series B a month ago, another 18 million. So there's been a lot of good buzz and press and we've been very fortunate, so I'm happy to share some of our success stories around the PR, uh, around uh, you know, the funding and, and the product, as well as some of the, uh, the challenges. And I'll just introduce myself briefly. I've been uh, a journalist for 15 years now. I a scary thought, but I started at Time Magazine. I went on to Business 2.0, uh, Fortune Small Business, Fast Company, I think after Mark was on the cover, and, uh, and now I'm at Mashable. So, uh, we have here the, the holy trifecta of entrepreneur, PR, and journalist. Normally, we don't sit together. Yeah. Mortal <laughs> <laughs> enemies. Small enemies. Um, 
Well, great. Let's, let's start with you. I want to take you back to when you were a fresh-faced young entrepreneur, not being not fresh-faced now. But, um, fresh -er. uh, fresh -er. yeah. um, what was your first uh, experience with journalists? Did it precede your first experience with the world of PR? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How was it? How did it go? So I think when you're a first-time or early entrepreneur, you really, you're, you're trying to get press, you want to get buzz for your company and your idea, and you're probably willing to do more or give out more information than you would later on when you've got you know, more, more uh, experience or uh, more options. And one of the things I probably did early on um, too much was to give information that I didn't necessarily want out there to the journalist. Uh, part of their job is to dig and dig and get that information that maybe no one else got. So they're going to push you and uh, try to get information. And uh, you know, when you go into an interview, you need to know what you're willing to talk about and uh, also, importantly, what you're not willing to talk about. So I think I did more of that early on and learned from that later. And uh, I think I'm much better about that and going into the game plan and knowing what I want to share. I guess I'll give an example of that. So recently, with the, um, the Series B financing that I had referenced, uh, a journalist that I spoke with was really pushing us on valuation. And we hadn't disclosed that, and we weren't going to. And she got to the point where she said, well, I'm not going to write the article unless you tell me that. So wow. the answer was, fine, don't write the article, because you're not going to get that from me, because we've decided not to, uh, not to distribute that information uh, to any journalist, you included, and the other 20 that I have on hold that want to you know, talk about the story because it was a lot of money and there's a lot of interest in it. So um, she ended up coming up with a number herself and published that. And this is a big, big magazine, hard copy that all of you read every week. And it was a bummer because um, I called our uh, investors because they were the only other ones with that information. And they said, no, none of us provided that information. Uh, so. It, you know, it's a two-way street in that you want information, but the journalists also want information from us. So, um, so don't look at it just as, you know, what can the journalists do for me? We're, if we have a good story, they want it too. And at this point, you know, we probably won't be working with her a lot, even though it's a big publication, as well as our investors who have a lot of portfolio companies, right? So now they're kind of turned off too. Um, so. I've, you know, that, that, that's kind of a long, long answer, um, with hopefully a lesson in there that is interesting, which is know what you want to go into a conversation with to share. Um, you can't always control what they're going to print, and in the rare cases that they print something that's kind of off the reservation, you can decide at that point whether or not to work with them again. And that's kind of where we are. Yeah, we generally stuff in love our fuzzy math. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's fuzzy on the paper. Um, yeah. Even when it's right there in an S1 for you. I know. <laughs> you would think we'd be able to read those things. Um, so, take me back to you know your first experience with this new social networking startup and this fresh. Oh wow, that's right a now. really fun story actually because yeah. it, it actually includes um, Ben Parr, your oh, colleague okay. um, from Mashable, or at least the 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 story I remember the best because it was about a week into my job at Facebook in 2006 and we had 7 million users um, which in retrospect I guess wasn't a lot back then um, though for many that is a lot in this day and age um, and they were about to launch a product called Newsfeed that I had to get up to speed with very quickly um, and here we, we turn it on and 750,000 users protest within an hour using the product. So I had probably 150 journalists emailing me immediately, calling me, um, many of whom I didn't have relationships with, um, at least good relationships with prior to, to that. Now I feel like I can call many of them friends to some degree after the, the war years. Um, but it was a challenging time, and uh, you know, speaking to failures. Even now, I think now I look back, um, and, and as does the industry, that Newsfeed was probably one of the most amazing products that Facebook brought to to the industry in multiple different ways. Um, we did a lot of things wrong with that launch, um, and first and foremost was that one, we didn't educate the users properly about the privacy. Um, 
issues around it and so therefore created issues ourselves because really looking back on it um, there weren't privacy issues around it it was just ex showing information in a different way than what the users were used to um, and secondly we didn't take the time to educate the press in advance in a way that they needed to understand a what Facebook was as a product and and B what newsfeed was because at the time um, those of you that that may have been using it then you were probably in college um, and it was just open up to to the broader um, user base at that time um, and and so we had a huge perception issue really on our hands then and it was because we didn't really understand at the time how we, we needed to educate people. And oh, by the way, we made that mistake a few times after that <laughs> um, over the years. But. And it, uh, a slow learning <laughs> yeah. process. Yeah. Well, we can get to that. So, so I wanted to just take us through the whole process. You know, it's a process that three of us are intimately familiar with, from the first pitch to a journalist. Let's say you, you have your product. You're ready to tell the world about it. You're looking forward to being on the front cover of Time magazine, and uh, you know you, you send out that first email, uh, or maybe you hire a, a PR person to send out that first email. How are you guys trying to attract our attention? What do you what are you trying to put in that picture? Okay, so I think before I even send that email out, I've established a relationship, I hope, with you or one of your colleagues, let's say at Mashable. Mm -hmm. um, I've tried to build that over many years. So I've been doing this for 12 years, and I go to a lot of tech events and meet um, you know, other great entrepreneurs like people in this room, journalists, investors, advisors. So hopefully I've got some kind of relationship with somebody there that I can at least reference. I think that's important. Um, before I have a conversation with you, I have thought about um, what areas do you cover because, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say Mashable, there are different people there covering different segments, kind of like in venture, uh, venture capitalists, you've got someone who does semiconductors and someone who does consumer and green and whatever. You guys have different beats as well. So I want to make sure that who am I addressing, do you understand my market? And then once I have all that in place, then I want to think about my message. And it's really important, don't go into an interview without thinking that through ahead of time because it's, it's probably going to be a disaster. Um, think through your message, think through your, um, your, your short bullet points of information, kind of those, those talking points, those sound bites that I want to get across to the journalist. And what, the, the pieces of the interview that matter most, I think, are the first couple minutes and the last couple minutes. Somewhere in the middle, things get fuzzy often, but it, I think about what, if, I was, if I was writing this article for the journalist and handing it over, what do I want as a title and the bullet points? And that's what I'm trying to get across right away. Typically, at the end of the interview, you would say, hey, Rick, anything else that we didn't cover or that you want to you touch on? If we didn't cover something, I'm going to do it then. And in, even beyond that, I'm going to say, just to remind you, you know, you know, uh, Branch out, it's safe, secure, it's professional. You know, I'm, I'm going to remind you of those key points that I want to make sure you get in there. So I'm going to have all that done ahead of time, and and then I then I feel confident that I've got a good shot that you're going to write something that's accurate and hopefully positive and something that I'm going to be happy with. I yeah, I would actually echo the first part of what you were talking about, and as Chris was talking about the pitch, the email pitch that goes out, I I just. I, I cringe when I think about people launching products that way, that, they, that journalists get these like structured pitches from people they, they don't know and it's you know one of 200 emails they get in their inbox and um, I think that founders that really take the time to get out into the industry, whatever your industry is, whether it's the wine industry as I was talking to, to Summer about earlier, or the tech industry, Go to Disrupt, um, go to Mashable's conferences, go to all these places where you're mixing with journalists um, and bloggers and develop those relationships. And it doesn't have to be with Mike Arrington. I mean, he has a whole staff of people now that work for him. So find Jason Kincaid or, you know, find someone that works for, for Chris. Um, you know, there's any number of people at all these blogs. And, and develop that relationship so it's not a blind email. Um, and I think in the early stages, treat PR as 
an essential piece of your business, and you don't need someone like me. I mean, someone like <laughs> me and an agency should be far down the road for you. Uh, in the early stages, uh, you know, Cora is a great example. They have 20 people at their, their company. They, uh, the founders are from Facebook, they're friends of mine. They reluctantly hired me, and I reluctantly took the job because they spent so much of their first 18 months um, at, at that company seeding their product with the right people, getting to know the, the reporters, um, and, and really telling their story organically instead of like, we're gonna launch, here's the product, okay, everybody go. Mike Arrington, you're gonna write about it, aren't you? You know, yeah. or, or Pete Cashmore, you're gonna write, right? No, no, you're not. You don't write anymore. And, and, and to that point, I think, you know, for a product launch, that's a big deal. You don't have that many product launches. Maybe it's one a quarter that that matters. But um, there's here's an acronym: TUB. So, is it timely? Is it unique? And is it buzzworthy? Okay, if it's not one of those three, don't go to the journalist with something that's kind of interesting to you because it's probably not that interesting to them. You want to go uh, to them when you have a real announcement, whether it's um, something that's timely. So I'll just I'll use examples for myself because I think that's probably the best way to illustrate it. So LinkedIn went public two weeks ago, three weeks ago. We had a lot of calls from the press. That, you know, so LinkedIn's number one, they're kind of Coke and we're Pepsi, right? So it's, it's one and two. And um, we had a lot of calls from the press because it was a timely event. LinkedIn went public, $9 billion, $9 billion IPO, huge. And um, so we had a lot of calls. So I needed to be ready to address that. And how does Branch Out feel about this? You know, are we scared? Are we happy? And the answer is we're, we're thrilled. If they're number one, we're number two. It's pretty good to be Pepsi if Coke is worth nine billion. Then that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> that felt good, right? The Wall Street Journal did, a, did an article that said, um, was it like the Branch Out? Branch Out CEO is smiling all day. Like I don't think anyone cares if I'm smiling. My girlfriend doesn't care. Like, <laughs> the Wall Street Journal, that was what they went with. So that's cool. Is it unique? Is it is it something that is going to be a unique story that? Um, that Mashable's readers care about, right? So um, if it's not unique, it's probably not gonna be that interesting. And if it's not buzzworthy, if you're not doing something that's gonna generate some buzz, whether it's um, a big funding round, a big exit, a big hire coming or going, some big exec, if it's not one of those three or four things, or a big product launch, like you know uh, the iPad 2 or something really substantial, if it's not one of those four things, don't waste your bullets um, calling Mashable or TechCrunch or the other guys because you're eventually kind of a crying wolf. Call them when you got one of those things. I, I would actually add to keep those pieces of news separate too. Don't bundle a funding announcement with the product launch because the, the news gets confused and the product becomes less important than the funding or the product needs to live up to the funding or... Yeah, it's a different news. Thing, yeah, for sure. so, so make sure you're focused on, on the different parts of the, the, the milestones of the business at the time that you should. And, and just to be self-serving, so I'm sure all you guys will be pitching Nashville one day. Uh, I'll just go through a list of you know, email fails that we get from the start. Um, the, the bulk email that looks like it's been sent to 100 people and maybe the name is in a different color or a different font size. We, we do notice that. I am so embarrassed to do that. Oh my god, I'm so sorry on behalf of my profession. <laughs> uh, using, using jargon in the first few sentences, it's going to get us to move on to the next email. Uh, you know, uh, solutions in the first sentence. No. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> um, you know, just just make it human and appealing, and, and think about if you were a journalist. You know, what's what's the human interest story here? What's the new product? Here? And, and do a little bit of research on the publication because we are different. We have different audiences. If you read us for half an hour, you know, each, you'll be able to tell those differences. And you'll also be able to tell what the person you're pitching to is interested in. Uh, you know, we all have different beats that are pretty easy to figure out. You don't, really, you don't even need to go to our bio pages and just look at the last, you know, five or ten stories we've written. Uh, so those are some basics. So I want to move on. So let's say you made it successfully through the pitch process. You've made yourself or your CEO sound human. You've gotten to us, we're sitting down around the table. Um, <laughs> there we go. Um, what 
Perhaps the best way to phrase this is what, what's the worst interview situation you've ever been in with a journalist? And you're allowed to use the Mark Zuckerberg. Um, <laughs> <laughs> even though you weren't there. I was on but maternity leave. Yes. <laughs> Does everyone know what, what this is about? At, at uh, D8 last year, all things D, at All Things D last year, Mark Zuckerberg was one of the interviewees. And he got up there and he was sweating bullets. 60 minutes? Looked white as a sheet. No, this was uh, this, is a, this was actually that. live on stage with uh, Cara Swisher yeah. and Walt Mossberg, you know, two two giants of the uh, of the tech reporting world. And uh, he just uh, he, he looked pretty ill. And, uh, <laughs> they invited him to take his hoodie off. Mm -hmm. He had this weird pentagram design on the inside of the hoodie, which they actually took as the basis for their hoodie that they gave out at this year's yeah. conference. Um, you know, it was just, it was a disaster from, from start to finish. I had a three-week old. I wasn't there. <laughs> so, okay, second worst interview situation. Uh, wow. Um, I have to think about that for a second without ratting out <laughs> people I mean, that I respect I mean, deeply. With, with cover stories, with, with like Fast Company and, and Time, I mean, I know you talked to yeah. Nick Gross when you at that time. Yes. Um, um, you know, it's, it's kind of easy because they, they want you to succeed, right? They want the interview to go well because they don't have a Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, I, I mean, I don't think it, it it's any secret that, that Mark Zuckerberg is brilliant. He also um, is, is awkward at times socially. So, so often um, the interview process would be um, challenging from the standpoint of him sort of warming up to the reporter and so really how we overcame that over time um, for any of you who either work with somebody like that or are yourself that way in a sense of that you're just not comfortable sitting there talking about yourself because I think that's a lot about what um, Mark's reservations were is that